And it's like, well, we just, we just did like 20 to 30 sprints where you're chasing after a Frisbee or a football or a soccer ball. We just did 20, 30 of those. And how are your times faster after that? And so that, again, that, that's also another thing that I observed. And it's like, this doesn't fit our current model. Because again, you, depending on how the person perceives the event depends upon how their body is going to react to that. That was Jared Burton. And you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. In athletic performance training, as well as human training, you could say, we tend to look at things from a linear uh, progression perspective. So what exercises, A, do I select, plus uh, sets and reps, B, or what arrangement do I do, equals C, the goal. And it is very important to have a good grasp of training structure and how to arrange things. But at the same time, we need to appreciate the complex nature of training and the human being. Human beings are a system of systems. And one of those systems is the brain, the nervous system. And that nervous system is strongly impacted by the way we perceive things, our emotions. And if you spend time around experienced coaches, elite coaches, so many of them really value not just a good training scheme, but also how the athletes are mentally and emotionally processing that training. Today's guest is Jared Burton. Jared is a human performance specialist, a chiropractic student, and a health coach. Jared got his coaching start in working with prior podcast guest Brady Volmering of DAC Baseball, and he has spent his recent years coaching, consulting, and running educational courses in the private sector. Jared focuses on engaging all aspects of an athlete's being in the scope of training, and before we recorded this podcast, I had really enjoyed the conversations that I had had with Jared on looking outside of the box in the scope of athletic performance, looking outside of the box in work capacity and adaptation patterns, and talking to Jared just gets some really interesting questions going in my mind. And the answers to those questions as they've been filtering in over time have been really beneficial to me. And I think this podcast and this conversation will be really beneficial to you as well. So, in it, we'll be getting into some important ideas on the mental and emotional state of the athlete, perception, how athletes go through the workout from that perception perspective, and what that means for work capacity and training volume. We'll be talking about the critical role of boredom and interest in training, athlete awareness and self-discovery, and so much more. Before we get started with the show, I want to highlight our two sponsors. We have Lost Empire Herbs and Simply Faster. To grab 15% off your Lost Empire Herbs order, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly and grab 15% off Shilly Jit Resin, Pine Pollen, Phoenix Formula, and some of my favorite other herbs that I get from Lost Empire. I have sponsors that I use personally. I've been using Lost Empire for years, love them, would recommend them to anybody, and taking that natural herbal approach to supplementation has been really awesome for me uh, in the training that I do. So I definitely recommend heading to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly for 15% off. Our second sponsor is simplyfaster.com. If you have sports technology needs, sports data needs, simplyfaster.com is your one-stop sports technology shop. They have force plates, K-box and inertial training, timing systems, blood flow restriction, and so much more for any athletic data tracking need that you have or for various awesome training tools, head to their online store, simplyfaster.com. They have amazing customer service, and they've been with us almost since day one. Can't recommend them enough. All right, that being said, let's get to an uninterrupted podcast here with Jared Burton. Jared, so you had a training experiment you did. I'm sure your athletes have probably got variations of this as well, but where you personally were just doing only dunking and isos, I believe, on, on some level, like extreme, like long body weight isometric holds. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about the nature of that training session, what you were doing, and then some of the results and lessons you got from it? Yeah. So one of the things that piqued my interest about the idea actually came from Jay Schroeder, who tells a lot of tales, you know, and it's always the question of which ones are true, which ones are not. And, and so I wanted to, to test, you know, that kind of stuff out. You know, if you align your physical training, you align the intellectual aspect of it, your physiology, your emotions, 
and the spiritual aspect, you know, how is that going to influence a sports performance? And in this case, the sports performance I was seeking was to see if I can dunk, you know, in my entire career playing college baseball, I, I was not the most athletic. So jumping, I, I had a hard time even jumping in, like I'm six feet tall and I had a hard time touching the, the net. So basically I, you know, my, my vertical jump height was, you know, like a, the size of a deck of cards. It wasn't that high. So I, I wanted to see like, okay, if I just change the way that I'm training, cause all I've done is, is heavy lifts and kind of more of this West side or the Cal Deeds type triphasic, you know, if I, if I just dramatically change my training and my mindset, would I be able to achieve something that I've never been able to achieve before? So I set out for 30 days and I devised just some ISOs that I was going to do every single day. And some of those days was divided into two, four hour training sessions where I would essentially just hold the isometrics. And I wasn't really focused on max contracting or positions. I was just more of focusing on when I was in the position, imagining what it would feel like to dunk. So over and over again, as I was holding the positions, I just created this reality of the excitement that I would have as I dunk. So what would it feel like when I go to like push off of one leg? What would it feel like as I'm going through the air? What is the emotions that I would experience as I see the ball going through the, the rim? And then what were the emotions that I would feel uh, as I landed? And then what, how is my reaction afterwards? Would I give a smirk or would I give, you know, this like loud shout of excitement? You know, so I, I basically mapped all of that out and I just took those 30 days to generate this reality. And by the time that I was done with it, after the 30 days, I wasn't able to, to dunk a full basketball just because my hands are so small, but I was able to take like a gator ball or a dodgeball and I was able to jump up and actually dunk it. Now it wasn't pretty at all, but I actually dunked it. And so I was like, that's crazy. You know, so I, I generated this new reality for myself. I achieved it. And then following that experiment, I tried, I, I basically recapped and I said, what was, what did I feel like was my weakest link going into the jump? And I felt like it was my feet. So then I took another two weeks to do nothing but train my feet and get them as strong as possible. And I use long duration isometrics for that as well. And when I did that, I went back and my movements were a lot more fluid and I was able to freely just jump off of both legs and then it just like, it was like, uh, it was like mowing the lawn or riding a bike. Like it, it just felt so easy. So that, that's kind of my experience. But like I said, there was, I focused more on creating a different reality for myself and really buying into the motions versus just the grunt work of, Oh, I need to train this. I need to activate this or I need to lengthen this and et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, you said a few things that made me think of some things that Paul check has said. One was, there was a video of him doing, Mike Salemi was on the show a long time ago who had worked with Paul and talked about working in the idea of uh, just different, like almost like Tai Chi inspired breathing exercises between sets to kind of re-energize. And Paul had talked about um, doing those. There was one exercise he was doing on a physio ball and talking about, well, you're doing this between sets. You should be focusing on your, your dream. He uses that term a lot, but really it could just be our athletic goals. You know, you could just say it's that or the version, the thing you want to accomplish. And one thing that I, I do think about uh, well, really, two is one. It, the you know, people talk about don't be on your phone between you know sets or whatever, which you you see in gyms, and it drives you know a lot of people. It drives me nuts to see that a lot. But you think, well, what's the alternative if you aren't on your phone, but you're I don't know, just walking around doing nothing? Like, is that how much better is that really? Like, you have an opportunity rather to really be intentful and mindful of the ultimate goal of what you're doing. And so I think about that, and then also be it long ISOs or uh, even like Jay Schrader's stand at attention where you're just like literally just standing there, just staring at a spot, like holding your body like still. Uh, or maybe it's just a really dense training packet where you have maybe only 30 seconds to rest between things. It just those, to me, those almost afford more of the opportunity to be more intentional on the goal, like whatever that is. As long as that awareness is put in by hopefully the coach. I just think that's something that is often missing and I'm sure we'll be getting into that a lot today. So, um, yeah, really interesting with using the ISOs or ISO holds is also like a dual, like it's almost like a hypno, uh, you know, visualization, uh, you could say as well. Yeah. Well, the, the awareness really comes 
from the athlete. I, I will say that because, you know, it's, it's like you, you can expose them to as many research articles. You could come up with a presentation, a documentary. You could provide all this information for somebody. And if, if they don't want to apply it for themselves and they won't, don't want to dig deeper for themselves, it, it's kind of wasted. So it, it's more of how do you meet the athlete where they're at in their current state? And then how do you, you know, figure out the things that they enjoy, the things that expose them? And then how do you draw out for them to kind of, you're drawing out the creativity within them. So then once they start to be able to create, then they start having that awareness uh, to say, or, you know, if they, the more awareness they have, the more they're able to create, you know, I don't know which one comes first, but regardless, the, the point is that basically put them in a situation where they become the captain of their own ship. You know, they're, they're fully in tune with what their body is doing and what it's not doing. You know, like one of my favorite examples, I think is of, of George St. Pierre. There's a documentary on him and he was just talking about, you know, when he's learning a new technique, one of the things that he focuses on is just the, the, like he basically analyzes his opponent, figures out where their strength is at, and then figure out, it does those strengths expose me? Okay, so now I'm going to take all of my time to be able to master and be able to defend his strengths so that I'm no longer exposed. And he's like, majority of people will go through techniques, they'll do one technique for 45 minutes and then another one for 30 and they, and they keep just rotating. He's like, I would just spend whatever it took, hours, weeks, months on the one you know, aspect of that training that I was exposed in until I no longer felt exposed. So it's that, that kind of mentality to say. Sometimes you hear things that open up your mind as to what's possible. And I mean, I, I agree with a, a lot. I think, well, I should say it this way. I think a lot of training theory, how programs are generally constructed is good. It's sound, it's helpful. But there's also those things that you hear where there's a clear rule break of that. And one thing that you mentioned with like the feet, you're like, all right, two weeks, I just got really obsessed with the feet and I was just doing these training. And you could take that even further. I've heard, um, I'll give a couple examples. One was um, Dan Bach actually had posted this. Uh, it was not an athlete. I don't believe he was coaching directly, but someone who just watched some of Dan's videos and then decided on his own, this is an athlete who was already very strong in the weight room, but he just decided on his own that he was going to just start doing all these single leg bounding exercises, like kind of knee to chest almost style single leg bounding. And he was just went and did it every day, <laughs> like literally every day, which I think even in the video, Dan was like, oh, I wouldn't have told you to do it every day, but the, the kid did it every day and he got, he dropped his 40 time like tremendously. It was like three tenths or something. And I don't know how long it was. It was a, a short three or four tenths almost in a relatively short period of time doing this thing every day. I remember also another story when I was at Cal, there was an athlete who was a really good long jumper in high school. He jumped like 25 feet. He had struggled a little bit in his years at Cal. And he was talking about when he was in high school, he's like, oh yeah, when I was in high school, and I was just the strength coach when I was in my years there at Cal for the track team, I wasn't coaching them on the track, but you know, he would talk to me about what he used to do. And he said that we used to just do bound, all this bounding like every day, like every day we did, it was like 500 meters of bounding or something crazy. And you would think like, well, how could you ever tolerate that? That seems so, so much. And again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, by saying that, I'm not saying that everyone should go out and do that every day, but I'm also not saying that, that, uh, like the single leg program that kid did, that that might not have been the best program for him, if that makes sense. And so with that being said, cause those are just, those are mind openers. You know, you, you think, well, 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 what if they would have just done that twice a week, you know, and what if in a smaller volume and, and again, I, I understand reasonable standards. I mean, the way I honestly make most of my training programs are closer to what you would say is the the traditionally accepted although i do it a little bit differently but fits within a lot of the standards uh, as we know them but then there's those those things that make you think and they expand your mind to what's possible and doing this every day and, and there's a lot of more examples of that anyways before i get too much farther on that train curious what you think about that concept and then just how we perceive fatigue fatigue in a program uh, fatigue in team sport I'd like you to get into that concept and then how we classify fatigue in training. Okay. I guess the, the biggest thing I would say there is you, you never really know what the, the main factor is of what sets that athlete apart. All we know is what they're thinking. 
And so if they buy into the fact that I need to bound every single day for five hours, and that's what's going to drop my sprint time, you know, by whatever, then if they buy into that reality, just as I bought into the reality, if I create my own reality and, and go through the experience of feeling joy and going through, you know, when I land that, you know, I, I personally chose that I would smirk and just kind of have this internal, you know, cry out of excitement, but I wouldn't really express it externally. And so it's, it's just more of whatever in my, and this is just my opinion. It's just whatever the athlete buys into. And so I don't think it's really for us to say whether that's right or wrong. Uh, and especially too, I mean, <laughs> even going into the volume aspect, I don't think it's really appropriate to comp like really comment on the, the volume aspect because just because the amount of volume that, you know, kids or athletes experience in a game is five, 10 times the amount of actual stimulus that we even give them in the training aspect. You know, I, I follow along the, the mindset that the, the training has to be a lot more intense. The training has to be more strenuous than the actual activity itself. Um, that you, your, you know, your bones, your ligaments, your muscles, all of that needs to be able to handle two times the amount of force that you're ever going to experience in a game. So I guess those are just kind of my thoughts, but that's the biggest thing though with that, regardless of how you train is, is how the athlete buys into whatever they're doing. And that's going to be greater than anybody's program. It's going to be greater than what I tell them or what I think they should do or what you, you know, what you tell them to do. And so that's, that's something that we have to understand is that we, we could have the best training in the world. We could have the best research back to back it up. It could be the most, you know, crazy thought. It could be woo woo, whatever it is, but it's, it's really just comes down to how does the athlete see it and how does it fit into the reality currently and how does it fit into the reality that they're trying to create that would be my answer with that but then the that kind of ties into fatigue a little bit and so how do we accumulate fatigue and i think the way that i'm starting to really understand it now um and, and it took me a long time to really understand it especially because you know when we're doing all of this high volume you know back when we were at the training facility in missouri i mean we're doing a lot of true shock training, high volume, high velocity, and how I know that we, it is high velocity, you know, that's a, another story if you want to go into it or not, but uh, I'll just leave that there. But regardless, what I was seeing is that we would have athletes sprint and they wouldn't drop off. You know, one of the biggest things that I, I had troubles with was that I, I followed, you know, DB Hammer's drop off system, a reg. And I did all of these isometric trainings and, and, and basically to build the work capacity. And it was like an hour to an hour and a half in. And it was like, I can't get anybody to drop off. So I was like, what, what is going on here? If, if I thought like no, somebody's going to drop off. Go into that just a little bit more quickly. So, uh, sorry, because for people not familiar with DB Hammer, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but oh, okay. yeah, that'll, don't want to okay, lose yeah. anyone there real quickly. So, so auto-regulation, essentially coming up with a, a, a system to figure out when an athlete is CNS is fatigued, when, when they should stop doing whatever practice activity. The way that we measure that, we would look at pupil dilation. And so we would look at how well the pupils constrict and then relax, whether they could hold the constriction or not, uh, just because we were trying to look directly at the, the brain, the nervous system, because the eyes are the brain. So that was, that was one of the ways that we regulated. We also regulated it with time. So you know how quickly somebody uh, dropped off. We also did this with throwing as well. So tracking their miles per hour and then we would look to see what percentage drop off they would they would uh, drop off at so whether it's one percent drop off two percent drop off i you know i think dv's fast switch is like one to three percent and then his strength is uh, i want to say like three to nine percent or something like that so you're, you're looking for those drop offs when you you know can't perform a, a specific bar speed or you know a run of certain time or whatever so that that's kind of what i mean with a reg but but anyway, so I, I wasn't really seeing the drop off. So I was, I was very perplexed by that. And so I had to do some thinking. And that's where it led me down into what, what is actually a muscle. And we think what muscle is. Muscle is pretty much water. And we say, okay, well, how do we know that muscle is water? And, and you know, we kind of know from the analogy of, of the creatine muscles. You know, all the people that load up on creatine, we say, oh, those aren't, you know, real muscles. They're just... They're just loaded with water because the, you know, the creatine absorbs all this water. But then if you, if you go to cut somebody's skin or if you cut somebody's muscle or they tear the muscle or whatever, there's no water pouring out into the body. There's no water pouring out of the body. 
So it's like, how do, how can we call this water when we cut, some, you know, if somebody gets cut, there's no water coming up. So what is going on here? And that's what led me to Gerald Pollock's work, which is the fourth phase of water that basically says that there's, there's a different state other than an ice or like a solid, a liquid, a gas, that there's this, this gelatin phase. And the way that this gelatin phase is structured is like a crystal, which is very fascinating because our bones are crystals. And they actually found that our, our, our uh, I mean, I found research papers back to the 30s of like teeth, DNA, your vertebra, everything from your skin is all run off kind of this piezoelectricity. So this crystal form, uh, which is also very interesting because the way that, you know, we, we learn of Wolf's Law and Davis's Law. So Wolf's Law is, you know, when you stress a bone, then the bone grows back stronger. If you, Davis's Law, if you do something to the skin, then, you know, it, again, it has this adaptation effect or whatever. So where I'm going with this is that I, I learned that the muscles behave like water. So if I want to learn about fatigue, I need to learn about water. And when it comes to water, and, and we can even find this, this was even postulated uh, in Anatomy Trains with Tom Myers in the first chapter, he says the fascia system is, is, has its own memory. It's like its own nervous system. It, it, it reacts at the speed of light. It's outside of the nervous system. It's like its own thing. And, and there's other people that have actually confirmed this with research and guys like Robert Becker. And I said, you know, Gerald Pollock and, and there's many other people to, to confirm this, but, and so we now know that water has an intelligence. It has a memory associated with it. So when it becomes to training, you know, if I'm going to, if an athlete starts getting fatigued, let's say he starts dropping off, his muscles start cramping. Does that mean that we should stop the training? What I found is no. <laughs> That'd be the worst time to stop the training. Because what we want to do is we want to raise the tolerance. We want to change the way the, the uh, water has memory to say. We want to change the way that the body's thinking. Because you get, you get to the point where you start tracking people with isometrics or training. And it's like they always stop at a minute 30. Or they always stop at a, a minute. Or they never go longer or anything like this, or, or, you know, it's like the marathon runners, you know, the, the four minute mile, you know, it's unbreakable. And then all of a sudden somebody breaks it and then everybody breaks it, you know, after that. So it's creating this new tolerance piece. So that's one aspect with the, the fatigue is that if you push the body to go further beyond what it's capable of, it generates a new tolerance. And obviously there's safe, you know, safe ways to do this and et cetera. So it's not just crazy. Okay. We're going to go, I don't know one rep maxes for 50 times throughout the day. You know, I'm talking in, in ways that can be healing for the body, which is why I use isometrics, but we can go on that in a second. Now, the other thing with fatigue too is, is with that, because water has this memory, this is where, you know, if you, if you Google a chart on the internet, it's like effective states or whatever, and, and it's like this arrow, it's like divided in half. So you, you basically it's, it's created, so it creates like a, a cross. And these effective states is basically show between arousal and boredom. So this is the other thing that I started figuring out with athletes as well. And this is with the, the help of Brad Adams at, at Transcending. This is a lot of his work where it's like, I can take somebody, they're sprinting and they start, you know, maybe they start slowing down. Maybe they start feeling fatigued, but all of a sudden, let's say they play football and I roll a football out as if it's a, a fumble recovery. Then all of a sudden their time jumps back up again. So there is something about the football or the external object that aroused them to reach this new state. And so this, this is very important. So then it's like, okay, so now I can manipulate how the body is being fatigued or not by including different scenarios that are either going to peak their arousal or cause them boredom because two are, the two are very important to know and to train. So end of summary, I guess to say with that, one of them is understanding the role of water. So if water has a memory and intelligence, how you train the muscle, whether it's slow, fast, you stretch it, you do shock training, whatever it is, whatever training you do is what your body is going to adapt to. I think we all can agree on that. And then the second one is the arousal states where it's, if somebody seems like they're starting to drop off, you can affect their arousal states or you can make them bored. Two are very important because if you make them bored, then they have to learn how to come out of that, which is also important. So 
our, our body doesn't really, to me, run off of the energy systems that we're taught. And if you want more information about that, then I would go into the, like I said, Gerald Pollock, Gilbert Ling, and uh, Harold Hillman. And Gilbert Ling wrote a nice book, basically disproving how a- basically ATP is not the primary source of energy. And so our primary source of energy in our body is actually light and it's infrared light. So if we're going to fuel ourselves, we actually need to be around light. And so, but like I said, uh, more information about that, you can go dig into those people, Gilbert Lang, Harold Hillman, and uh, Joe uh, Pollock, and then even uh, another guy, Dr. Thomas Cowan talks a lot about it as well. So, Yeah. Yeah, it would be, it would certainly make for an interesting debate to get the, you know, the traditional physiology and some of that together. But I, I, uh, for me, I think, I don't know how far we necessarily have to get into that to kind of get into, well, what does this mean for a practical session? And for a practical yeah. session, I, I think I, I want to take this a couple of ways. First, you know, all this stuff, it does make me think about, and this is like the elephant in the room because an elephant in the room is the, um, like Rob C said it well, I'm not against tempo training, like for track, for example, like running six, two hundreds or something. I'm against the abuse of tempo training. So for track and field people out there, this one example is you see all of, and I've, I've seen this myself since I've gotten onto the high school scene, since I moved back to Ohio is I have seen the abuse of tempo where kids are just mindlessly running and shin splints are, and mindlessly being an important word there. Uh, shin splints is quote air quotes, part of it. You know, the coaches have their like at the ready shin splint, like what backwards walking remedies. I'm just like, this is not the way it should be. And I think everyone yeah. who listens to this podcast, most people, uh, the vast majority, I'm sure, uh, are well, well aware of that. And then the same thing obviously happens in team sport all the time. Like my neighbors, uh, the middle school kids in my neighborhood, that I think their football team, the kids were like, yeah, we ran 10 100s at the end of practice. And I'm sure they were all very low quality and the kids, you know, hated doing them. And yeah. so like that that kind of stuff is rampant. I think that's the kind of stuff that the pendulum is trying to swing back against. Like all oh, this high volume, you know, oh, let's just be tough and let's just do this. And so here's here's where I wanted to go with that too, though, was with the track, uh, you, you would, might talk about uh, like a, a Clyde Hart was a coach at, at Baylor for a long time, quarter mile U, high volume, like tons of tempo, over distance, lots of volume. But guess what? There's a lot of athletes there that did really well with it. I spent some time at Wisconsin Lacrosse, which was a really power, a D3 power, powerhouse in track and field. They they ran pretty similarly to that Clyde Hart style, lots of tempo, lots of longer distance stuff. Part of that was by nature they didn't have an indoor track for the fall and it was Wisconsin, so it was just freezing in the fall, so they had to maybe there's some seasonality stuff too. They had to be outside in the cold for a long time. There's always a lot of factors. And then they got an indoors in January, but they they also were insanely successful. I mean, that program was so successful. And so it's I think as soon as we say, oh, well, that's the wrong way to do it, <laughs> there's just more to it, you know? And so what yeah. I'm trying to get at is this, is what is the line with all this stuff? It's like, okay, yes, there's, there's mechanisms in the body that help us to um, do more, be it that overarching mental part in the, to- like that's the other Paul Check thing I was going to mention is that the top of his totem pole is basically, it's the mind, it's the spirit, it's the governing it's the, the, you could call it the brain, the nervous system, if you want, whatever term you want to give it, it's the thing that governs all other adaptation. And so you have that at the top and I already, I'm almost kind of forgetting where I was going with this. Anyway, well, no, I, I yeah, think so, if I'm hearing you correct, I, I, I think where you're getting at in the next question should be is, is okay. Well, if we're doing this high volume and, and we're doing all these different reps and the stress how do we manage that so athletes aren't getting injured because the reason why it's an issue is because we see athletes getting injured or we see athletes running slower or whatever it is yeah because uh, this was my exact experience is you know i i come at we we start the brady and i go to the facility the brady bowling so we go to the facility to, to to train guys we have this workout plan scheduled and then i get these athletes and it's like what did you do for the day okay, well, we already did CrossFit. We did like a thousand burpees and then we had to do like stair runnings. And then we finished with, you know, one rep max of deadlift, squat and bench. And it's like, you already did that today? <laughs> and so it's like, okay, so what do I do now? And then it's like, okay, well, how are you feeling? Oh, my, my back hurts, my knee hurts. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it's, it's so easy to be like, oh, well, we should never do that. And we should just do, you know, 
uh, low volume and, and never stress the guys like that. But the, the way that I approached that was, I was like, okay, I'm going to try something a little bit different. Okay, if you're doing that amount of volume, then how can I re-educate your body? How can I observe these compensatory pathways that are going on within your body? How can I change those so that you can handle what you're required to do in your, in your athletic sport? So then this is where it starts getting into, you know, more of the, where, where I'm, you know, I looked at a, a lunge and I looked at how somebody compensated within a lunge. And then I go watch them sprint and I take a video of it. And it's like, wait a minute, the, the same conversations that I just saw in that isometric is showing up when you sprint. So what if we teach you to create tension or engage a muscle differently that is going to help you more be able to distribute the force within your body more appropriate so then you can handle, you know, whatever activity you're doing. So that, that's the way that I approached it and which eventually led to me looking at whether there's tone in a muscle or not tone in a muscle. And wherever there's no tone, we need to create tone. And once you basically rechange the compensatory path or, uh, patterns and you create tone where there's no tone, now all of a sudden they can handle <laughs> that strenuous training. But now I will say, though, it doesn't just end at the physical. The mind does play a huge role into it. And, you know, whatever's happening in the physical is just manifesting from something deeper. It's manifesting from some sort of emotional experience, which is why the perception and action is so key when it comes to actually rehab, you know, not just, okay, well, if we do these exercises and you meet these physical markers, then you, you're going to be able to return to play. Because as soon as the athlete gets into their sport, they get in the same situation where they tore their ACL you know, whatever that was, you know, looked like, whether it was being pressured defense, they didn't see somebody coming up behind them and they experienced that same experience again, then they're susceptible. It doesn't matter how much training you do. So there's, again, there's that memory aspect within the body that, you know, how I tore my ACL or how I strained my hamstring, whatever, that memory is stored within the body. So you have to change that. And that's where the perception and action comes into play as well Is it's how do we train the person? And then also when we come to the the perception and action, how do we create a scenario that's identical to the scenario that caused the injury so that you no longer become afraid or you no longer become timid in this situation? So that's, that's just as important. So I know that's a little bit tricky when people are just running, you know, nonstop and they'll have shin splints, but you know, there's just different examples of, you have to know what you're dealing with. You know, if it's, if it's something like that, where everybody's getting shin splints, okay, well then we need to look at people's compensatory pathways. If it's a thing where like there's this ligament injury or there's something that happens in the sport of play, okay, well, maybe we need to look at this perception and action and change, you know, how the person perceives that event. And, you know, that's where the whole field of sports psychology comes in. But when I say perception and action too, I got to clarify that, you know, I'm not talking about just randomly throwing balls and different objects and have people chase each other and, and play tag and whatever. You know, if you look into the fear research that the military has done, and I mean, many other as well is if the only way that you can handle a fear like conflict is to be put in the fear conflict itself. So you have to, as a coach, be able to be very educated in a way when to be able to put this athlete in a situation like that so that you can resolve that fear and then also have the discipline and the control to know when to punt. Essentially, when no to, okay, let's put a pause on this for a second. Let's dial back. And so, but those, those things play a huge role into it, but that, that would be my, I guess, answer to that. It's kind of lengthy, but. Sir, sure. so I mean, I think that maybe based off that, I can give, kind of give you my take too with those programs where to me, it's like two volumes could, could hit differently. I mean, I like some of these volumes I've seen in high school, it's like, all right, we're going to run. I mean, this is not a great way to run, regardless of any mentality, in my opinion, not a great way to run sprint practice, but it's like, we're going to go. 2400 yards of or meters of of sprinting today for like tempo and (laughs) it's like you can just make a ladder up like which happens all the time in high school and have the kids run it but like Mm -hmm. like you said like there could be a lot of compensations because they don't move well there's going to be a lot of like different mental and emotional responses to that versus like when i was at wisconsin lacrosse i'm watching these athletes do their 200s which you know eight by 200 or whatever 10 by 200 I, i I don't think they really went over 10 there, to be honest, but they were so in tune. Like they would run in a line because they had to run in the outside lane of the indoor track. And it was like a machine. I think they might even have taken turn two lead. Um, they were on a very fine, like, all right, two minutes. Then they were like, the intention was very high. There's always like a senior who was kind of leading it. 
And yeah. that's a lot different than people just slogging through it with pain looks on their faces. Yeah. And, and not to mention, too, these athletes were college level, like higher level, more talented, less compensations as well, more likely. So they could tolerate it. And you could look at even like, you know, Baylor or something like that. Imagine you get kids that are running 46, 47 in the 400 in high school. They probably aren't going to have nearly as many compensations as someone who runs a 53 or something, 55 or something like that. So maybe you can get away with, there's always those kids that survive those programs and, and succeed. So there's, there's those things to look at. But for me, I would never, you know, there, there's so much more that you can do within that volume to make it, to drive intention and to avoid, you know, the compensation patterns as well. I can go into some ways that I've done that, but yeah, you had something you were going to follow up with there. Well, yeah, I was just, situations like that is they become a collective conscience where the situation is bigger than themselves. They don't care what they're doing. They've bought into the idea that as a program, as a team, that this, this is the mission. This is what needs to yeah. be accomplished. So as a team, we're all going to buy in and we're going to do this. And so when you have that mentality, yeah, you, you're not really going to have those in my, in what I, my experience, in my opinion, you're not going to have those injuries because everyone's bought end to say of what they're doing and there might be that one guy who's not and then everybody harps on that one guy and he might have the the pain in the knee or whatever or, you know oh well my knee hurts so i need to be done you know whatever there, there's just cases like that but it's it's the collective conscious like we're all quantumly entangled um you know and so it's they bought into that and so that that's what i would say to that because <laughs> they're indoctrinated that it's bigger than them you know they're doing something you know bigger than them or you know and they create competitions but you see it all the time I mean, that was a big thing. And I don't know, I've seen like, I won't say any colleges, but yeah, you, know, you, you just see like the different events that they do. It's, you know, it's like the hell week. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's, it's where we become a team. It's where we, you know, become brothers. And it's just, it's a different outlook on it, on the activity. Yeah. I think that, yeah, with some of that type of stuff, you know, the, like the, the Navy SEAL stuff or whatever, I mean, fatigue or men, like you said, mental stress is specific. Like you mentioned with the military, military, like the fear, like until you're in it, like or, or devising ways to be insanely specific to it, there's a lot of specificity. But within some of that stuff, feeling like you're a part of something that's greater than yourself, I think that's the real adaptation, honestly. Like I don't think it's it's any, none of the actual like fatigue or anything of the toughness or anything like that. I don't think that's really much of it at all with that type of stuff it's yeah. just feeling bonded feeling like you're part of something greater those types of things no and i would totally buy into that and then when it comes to the individual athlete where i think they run into the trouble is they don't know their own identity and so rather than buying into something greater than themselves and they're buying into the team it's do you even know who you are do you even know what you want do you know your desires do you buy into yourself do you love yourself do you think you're a genius like so that whole aspect then plays into more of the individual athlete is the identity. And so that's, that's always at the center focus of my training as well as, is to challenge the athlete to figure out who they are as a person. Because I know that the more that they figure out about themselves, basically the, <laughs> the more they learn, the, the less likely they're going to be, like they know how to overcome injuries, they know how to overcome uh, situ certain or you know certain situations within games like they're just an overall better athlete better person etc so i think that should always be the goal and i think that's what you're getting at as well but i'm just kind of showing the i think there's the difference between whether it's something greater than ourselves or if it's an individual athlete and it's what do you think about yourself because how you directly think about yourself and how you speak to yourself is going to directly influence how you perform and what injuries that you might even have. You might speak into existent injuries. Um, you know, I see it all, all the time. And, you know, I'm just being in the chiropractor profession or being in when I'm shadowing different doctors or, you know, whatever it is, we, we have these patients that come in playing this victim card and, you know, they're just, they have no idea who they are and they, they speak into existence, you know, diseases and backaches and, certain tears and stuff like that because that becomes the reality you know just like i mentioned in the beginning i tried to when the whole dunk competition i tried to create a different reality for myself uh one where i didn't see myself as this you know first baseman athlete who can't move who can't bend over and touch his toes and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. you know rather i was jared burton 
the jumper. I was, it doesn't matter. Like I can jump as high, as high as I want, whenever I want. Like I'm awesome. I remember my genius. Like all, you know, I, I create a different reality for myself. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for with the athletes too, is with the individuality as well. Cause it's both. Yeah. It's interesting to think about that. And then, I mean, I've had tremendous success using uh, Logan Christopher has been on the show a few times and his uh, like strength hypnosis type tracks using those before sessions is the difference is pretty substantial. And, but you know, to get to like lie down for 15 minutes before a session, I, I mean, I think it's important, but sometimes I'm just like, man, I don't have time for this today. And you, you think about, all right, well, if you're doing an ISO before the session, you can, you can, well, and you shouldn't. That. Yeah. So that, that goes back to your effective states. So like, I have friends who want one of their best ways to warm up is to go punt, go punt a football. So there's no saying like you have to go sit down and somebody pull out the tuning forks and they put you in a theta brain state or a delta theta state, or you listen to some sort of meditative CD. Like you have to know each day what you need and what you want to do, like listen to that. And so if you want to go run around and maybe to warm up, you want to play racquetball or you want to go punt a football around or you know, you want to actually full on engage, like you're just ready to go and you just start tackling or whatever it is, you know, so that, that, that's, that's the component, which is, is very important to, to help instill within an athlete is what do you need? What do you need to get aroused? What do you need to get focused and just providing all the different tools so that they know what they can draw from. They know what they resonate with and they also know what they don't resonate with as well. That's a good point. Just because I think a lot of athletes, like, let's just say you had a group in and you're like, all right, we're going to do an ISO wall sit. And I want you to like, you know, think about the athlete you want to be, think about your dream. I mean, that sounds cool. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast would do that. I mean, I would do that, but a lot of athletes aren't going to necessarily do that, or they're just going to think about whatever. And for those athletes, and honestly, it's probably the majority in some cases, you just have them play a game that they enjoy before they go lift or whatever else. And their lifting is better. It's so it doesn't, yeah. it's just like, yeah, knowing the group in front of you and what's, at, you know, the simplest and, and most effective path, a lot of times the simplest is the most effective path to yeah. getting them to those higher brain states. So yeah, it could be a game, could be, you know, I, I do, or it could be both, you know, at some point or just different things on different days too. But I, I think too, it's like everyone always wants that one thing. What's that one thing I can do before all my lifts that, that you know, or, or as a part of my training that just ups yeah. the level? And it, it's listen to yourself. What do you want? Who are you? What drives you? What are you exposed in? What are your strengths, et cetera? Like those are the, those are the questions that you got to start asking for the athletes. But yeah, I'm right on for that. And, you know, and we, I mean, we experienced the athletes who had zero creativity at all. You know, you say, okay, what do you like to do? Nothing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to be over here. Come talk to me when you figure it out. You know, and sometimes people come back and they say, okay, I know what I want to do. And sometimes people just stand around for 45 minutes. And the session's over and they say, okay, have a great day. But, you know, I, the ways that we try and, and help with that is, okay, well, here's some soccer nets. Here's a, a you know, a rugby ball, a baseball. Uh, here's some gloves. Here's some hurdles. Go take these objects. These are the objects that you have to work with. Go create something. And everybody kind of looks at each other in a circle and they don't know what to do. And you just kind of sit and wait and you just, you just see what they create. And you just see what they do. And then, and then uh, if you have to intervene, you have to intervene. Because there's times where you have to, where it's just, you know, you're just kind of perplexed to what they're doing. But anyway, that's, it's, it's just another option to try and provide the, or the creativity to try and let them to start learning how to express themselves because they don't know how. Sure. So in nuts and bolts, you know, like, let's just say your athletes are running 10 meter sprints or 10 yards or whatever. How are you thinking about things that you can do in between? Like, let's say they do a few sprints. I mean, we've talked about this or this has been talked about on the podcast Jake Tura talks about, and I know you're on his show, playing a game of pickup, doing some dunks, playing pickup, doing some dunks like that would yield a lot more high jumps over an extended period of time, let alone you just think of that total training stimulus, all that playing. And then with these little explosive spikes in between, I mean, really cool. If you think about waveforms or whatever, it's pretty cool. But yeah. what do you, or as well as like, let's just play gator ball, let's play soccer and let's do some 10 meter flies in between. Then we'll go play it back and play again. Like that kind of like intermittent spike based waveform that can really i mean you're going to keep being good at that it's like what so maybe i'll ask you this what are the things if i just went out and ran started doing 10 flies and that's literally all i did and i and you know after for the average person they're going to run two and again this is the average there's going to be differences 
the average person is going to run two or three and they might get better on the second. They might do the best on the first. A lot of people do the best on the first. Then they start thinking about it too much and then they get worse. But most people are not going to run three, four, five, six, seven and get better and better and better if that's all they're doing, if literally it's just the 10 meter fly. So what are some of your takes on, well, first, maybe the thing that allows people just to just straight up be better at that, maintaining performance across a period of sprints, a number of sprints. Just yeah. sprinting being an example, one of many. You could use jumps or throws or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then what? Um. Yeah. So what? What? What causes someone to be better at that? And then what are some interventions, either in the workout itself, that could help them yeah. to get a better workout? Finally, training, just training general ideas that you can be better across a number of movements, that number of movements. Sure. So the biggest way I see that is you can ha- you have many options, but I can I can only really speak on the options that I've done and others have done and I've seen that work well. And, you know, those are things where it's, okay, you you first kind of have a template to say, and you want to know, okay, what, what is the goal for today? Is it just a run to run? Are you looking on max, you know, max effort? Are you looking at running at 30%, 60%, 70%, 90%? You know, are you looking at tinkering to say, um, not my term that, uh, you know, but it's more of, you know, how, how can you create tension? How can you engage certain muscles? You know, think of like, um, a Darien bar. That's when I say, you know, things like that. Think of like, how do I, how do I manipulate the body in a certain way to create tension differently? So then that I can use my appropriate levers to be able to propel me faster. So, you know, it's like, you know, maybe you're taking a scenario where it's like I said, you're all max out effort or you're taking a scenario and it's something like that where I'm going to, okay, I'm going to break it down. I'm only going to work at 30 to 40% and I'm just going to try and feel my movements out a little bit, whatever it might be. And so th- that, that's kind of the generic where the athlete needs to be able to decipher and answer those questions. And then from there, you have to understand that it can adapt. Somebody might come in and be like, I want to max sprint and okay, well, how many do you want to do? Okay, well, I want to do 20 max sprints. Okay. And you get into eight and all of a sudden they're not, they're not moving well. Their times are slower than they've ever been. So, okay, well, maybe we need to draw it back and we need to go into a little bit more of a tinkering. Uh, maybe we need to help you find tension. Maybe we need to, you know, do an isometric to, you know, get a muscle engaged. Maybe we need to do some vestibular engagement, like some rolling or some eye tracking stuff. You know, I, the list could go on and on. It, it's just the way that I go off of, and, you know, I, it might be helpful, might not be helpful, but one of the best advices that I ever got was to listen to your intuition. Well, how do you know to, for me, I'm in chiropractic school, how do you know to adjust the segment or how do you know to look here or test this muscle? Listen to your intuition. And so that's what I do. And so I just listen to my intuition of whether it's, okay, we should dial back, we should do this instead, or we should ramp it up, um, et cetera. So that's kind of how I view the training. And then I mentioned earlier too, being able to know how to provide external stimulus. You know, what are objects that they like? Do you want something that's flying over their head? Do you want something that's rolling on the ground? How do you want the ball to bounce? Is it a chaotic bounce? Is it a smooth bounce? How high do you want the bounce? You know, do you want a Frisbee? Do you want a mat to be able to run and dive on? It it becomes endless because once you start getting into those things like that, the brain starts turning off of forced work and starts going into this more relaxed, focused mode where it's, it's just... It's just responding to the environment. Yeah. There's no thinking. There's no thought. You know, you're just, okay, boom, I start sprinting. Oh, there's a Frisbee. Oh, got it. And, you know, and your mind starts turning off. So, and then you start seeing people run faster and then, okay, let's take away all these external objects and now let's go run and they start running faster. And it's like, well, we just, we just did like 20 to 30 sprints where you're chasing after a Frisbee or a football or a soccer ball, or maybe there is hand-to-hand combat. Uh, you were rolling around, et cetera, whatever it was. So we just did 20, 30 of those. And how are your times faster after that? And so that, again, that, that's also another thing that I observed. And it's like, this doesn't fit our current model. This doesn't fit this, what I've told that it, it's this A-reg, you know, you know, model where there's going to be these percent drop-offs. Because again, you, <laughs> depending on how the person perceives the event depends upon how their body is going to react to that, whether they're going to have the energy, they're going to be able to fire, whether they're going to have the timing, uh, you know, turn on certain muscles or not engage certain muscles and et cetera. So that's kind of what I'm looking for is essentially 
providing those different stimuluses and, and there's tons more than that, but you know, what can you do that's either going to get the athlete aroused or what's going to get them bored. And like I said, you have to know both because if there's something that exposes them and makes them bored, well, why is it? What about that? What is your connection to that? Why does that make you bored? Okay. Well, if I just throw boredom at you, how can you have that? So it no longer affects you. And then you can start performing better to say. And so that, that's just as important because, you know, it's not just about, well, what, what, you know, only living in the arousal state it's how can you train your athlete to get out of the boredom? Cause that, I mean, I know that happens for me when I played, I mean, I love to say that I was excited every single time I was in the field, but <laughs> baseball, when you're standing around and, you know, the pitcher is walking five guys in a row and you start getting bored and, and then you're, you know, hitting next, how do you get locked in? And so it's, it's some of those same principles where it's like, how, how do you know, how well do you know how to control your own effective state? How can you control your perception of the environment right now? How do you make sure that the one event doesn't travel over into the next play kind of attitude? So, so I, I, I hope that kind of answers your question, but th those are the specific things that I'm kind of looking for is it's more of a template. There's just, there's options. We affect the environment. We see how the athlete responds and we go from there. Yeah. I think that that's the thing that, I mean, it's, it's both a beautiful thing, but it's also a thing that can be confusing for a lot of people where I think a lot of times it can be, I mean, I think strength and conditioning in general is laid out as more, as with most industries is, is more of a linear, you know, do a with B get C, you know, and right. it's, just look at a basketball game. It's definitely not a B C, especially the more you get into it. There's all sorts of things going on. It's a very complex, the same way the human body is a, we aren't, we aren't one system. We are a system of interacting systems and a game is yeah. a system of systems. And there's always going to be a few things going on. And I do think that that is the beautiful thing is it gives rise to creativity. Um, I think people always want checks and balances, though. The same way I mentioned to, to run at track athletes till they get shin splints or to make middle schoolers do 10 mindless hundreds at the end of football practice. Like that stuff is really ignorant. But it's kind of yeah, like because you, have you can accumulate that same volume by doing what I just mentioned. You could yeah. say you could set out for they could accumulate 100 sprints. And we would say, oh my gosh, that's way too much. But how, how did you accumulate that? Well, we accumulated in such a way that their mind was, like their yes. mind saw it as no perceived threat. There's no threat for me chasing after a football with my friends. There's no perceived threat exactly. of me coming after a Frisbee. So now I can do with the 100 sprints. And we do it all the time. I mean, our baseball team, when I played, you know, we all, we all lifted and trained. And then, you know, then the motto was no playing basketball, no playing racquetball. Mm -hmm. What does everybody do? They go play sports after that. And it's like, it, it didn't make them worse. It didn't make them better. It just like guys are going to be guys or girls are going to be girls. Like they, <laughs> they need to go do things like, you know? And so it's like, it's silly to me to think that we can just put it down into this tiny box and say that you can only do 10 sprints. You can't do more than three. You're going to fatigue the guy. He, he's not. Cause once you start speaking that into existence, like, you can't run more than 10 or you're going to break down. That athlete starts now believing the fact that if I run more than 10, I'm going to break down. Yeah. Oh, well, shit. I, I was, <laughs> I was just um, having a podcast. Sorry to interrupt there, but I, no, uh, I, I don't know if this will go up before or after this one, but I was talking with Joel Reinhardt, who's a, a sports science and sports performance at Stanford. And, you know, it's like the sports science, um, There, this is not the norm, but there's more sports scientists who are are providing more workload direction for the actual football's practice schedule. Like, hey, this day, um, this kind of intensity, this kind of volume, uh, this kind of like time on feet or whatever factors they're using to dictate these things. But the thing with sport, unlike track, is like, all right, well, maybe you're doing mostly like work where you'd be running 20 yards max. But you know what? There's going to be a few plays where you end up running 40 or 50 and you can't like make it that clean, you know, it's, it's yeah. just going to end up being more complex. You end up have to be a little bit more robust than this sometimes uh, and for a team sport, a track can be more controlled, but at the same time I look at track, like, let's say we're only going to do fly 10 today. We're only going to do forties today, or in the weight room, we're only going to do front squats today, sets of five. And I look at, it's almost like some of those programs have evolved because of, and you mentioned it, I actually wrote four things down here as you were talking, but one of it is not straining. So under the, my four things I wrote that make this more volume possible is one, it's interest, there's interest and not boredom. Two, you're not straining, you're reacting in the same way that Jay Schrader, you know, he talks about 
most athletes do not train like they play sport. And when you look at the way that sport is and some of that forebrain, excess forebrain activity is taken out, that changes it. Um, Then I also have vision, you know, of who you want to be, what's your dream as an athlete. And then it's not restricted by a nocebo that someone threw in there. Oh, you can't do this. Like imagine if that guy who was trying to bound, I was talking about the Dan Bach example uh, with that athlete who's bounding single leg bounds every day. What if someone told that guy, oh, you can't do that. You know, like he, no, that wasn't yep. in his brain. And the same thing, I know Chad Wesley Smith has talked about, they interviewed Adam Nelson, the shot putter, and that guy was doing insane volume in the weight room. And later in his career, he's like, oh, that was stupid, but I was so driven that I made it work. And you watch how Adam Nelson was in the ring. He was like a fire plug. I mean, you take that mentality into any gym session, be successful. But anyways, the thing I was just thinking about is it, it is the, the strain, like the forceful straining, you only get so many of those reps. But what if you wave loaded it? What if I did, and I do this sometimes, like I could run nine, 10 meter flies if it's like, all right, the first one, I'm only, I'm only feel, this is a feel one. I don't care about the time. It's only for this specific connection in the body. Second rep, maybe it's speed gate golf, like Sam Portland's talked about. Instead of max, I'm just trying to hit this sub max time on the nose. Third one, let it rip. Then you start that series over again and you're getting more like components of the human um, mechanism, but you, the strain is only one out of every three, you know, but instead it's like, we just like, it's just like strain, strain, strain. And yeah, I think the the ability to, uh, and I'll say this too. I I, I was doing a workout yesterday that ended up being really good. And it was um, like last week for me personally, I, I, I ran a really good 10 fly last week on pavement, the fastest I've run in a long time. Some things have been really coming together for me. And you know, this week, you know, the law of the pendulum or the law of polarity, you're going to have an up, you're going to have a little down. And so this week just wasn't quite the sharpness. And But I had the idea for the strength workout I'm going to do. Um, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to do 500 low squat foot jumps and I'm going to do 100 explosive jumping pushups laterally. But the magic was, I wasn't even, I, I wasn't even that, it was a long day of work before that, wasn't like super motivated going into it. But I, the way I set it up made it magic, which was basically put some music on i liked did this the jumps in sets of 30 40 and 50 i allowed myself to explore the rhythms of those low squat foot jumps maybe i would jump one into a lunge or i'd jump one up onto a curve and back down periodically and then on the push-ups i ended up having that kind of dream goal vision like every rep showing up just materialized organically and by the time that work was done and someone would say oh wow 500 like that just seems like stupid volume but i'll tell you my nervous nervous system was like that that feeling you get after you hit a big lift a big jump yeah. like that floored like excitement my i mean it was like all cylinders were completely firing but if i would just went in and did like 10 mindless sets of 50 with no variation like those four boxes i listed would not have been checked and it would have been just a boring workout with just some volume versus something that really excited you and was interesting and that you were better the next day or two versus just taking on the volume so sorry i was just kind of going off a little bit but yeah no that's interesting concepts that's that's wonderful because i mean that's that's exactly what I'm looking at. And people sometimes get weirded off by the volume. Uh, even that I do is like, you know, a lot of times people are confused when it's like, yeah, you're going to be in a wall sit for an hour. They're like, well, how does this help me? Well, your hamstrings don't turn on. So, okay. But then once they realize that once they turn on their hamstrings, they have so much energy. Like I've never been able to move like this. I've never, you know, the force has never been able to distribute my timing of how my muscles fire or better. Except it's the same thing where it's like, we're not doing this as punishment. We're not doing this volume in a, in a mindless, randomized way. Like it's very strategic where it's either affecting, you know, the brain, you know, how you perceive the events or it's directly affecting which muscle is not firing. Where's the lack of tone in your body? Where's that fascia line that's not creating the tension when it needs to? Let's create some tension there. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, I just did a thousand reps, 2000 reps, but I feel better than I've ever had for the last five years. And so it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to grasp, but once you realize that you can train the body in a way that actually gives it more energy, you're refueling yourself. You're, you're, you're actually plugging yourself into the wall and you're, you're charging yourself up rather than working off of this, this battery pack that's old and it's, it's barely on anymore. And, you know, your reserve is so low. And so you know, that, that's what I'm looking at for, for that volume is you know, in those compensation patterns is what's not firing, what's not being perce- perceived accurately, how do we change that? And then you have more energy, you, you feel better and, and, you know, and that affects all of your walks of life. So, yeah, that's, that's like the secret right there. It's not, 
it's not so much that there is a true volume limit, but there is a volume limit for boring reps <laughs> and there's or mindless reps and there's a volume limit for strain reps. I mean, in fact, I would say the volume limit in my mind for boring reps is zero. I wouldn't do it. If anything's boring or mindless, don't do it. You know, it's, it's just stupidity but at that, that point. That's where you have yeah. to ask yourself, why is it boring? Yeah. What about that do you not like? Because something about that that you don't like is probably something about yourself that you don't like or an event or something like that that you don't like. So you have, that's where you have to be honest with yourself is there's something subconsciously that, you know, I hate golf or whatever. So if there's somebody that's playing something with golf or doing some sort of golf movement, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I need to ask myself, what is it about golf? Did I have an experience with golf that made it bad? Like, why is that? And most of the time you're going to find that there's some sort of experience of why they think this is bored. So that's why it's, it's, it's also very important to not run away from the boredom, but actually to ask yourself and be honest with yourself, is there something subconsciously in my mind of why I don't like this? It's the same thing of why we don't like a person. You know, a lot of times when you don't like an aspect about a person, it's most likely because that aspect that you don't like is an aspect of quality that you have and you don't like about yourself. Yeah. And it's the same thing about with the sport. Well, I don't like this. I don't like doing this ISO. I don't like sitting in this. Well, why don't you like sitting in this? Well, because I don't (laughs) want to think about what I'm doing. I don't want to be in tune with the, my true self, you know, and while, why don't you want to be in tune with your true self? Who scared you out of being your own intelligence? You know, why don't you want to tap into who you are? Those are the important questions. So don't run away from the board. And sometimes the boredom, we need those reps. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's got to be structured, though, in a way where, you know, when you need to punt, but at the same time, you know, when you need to stir the pot. Yeah. You know, and so it, it's, it's both very important. I think about back when I was coaching at Wilmington College, like 12, I'm trying, how long was that? 12, 12 years ago, this was happening around about is the, there was um, a, a new coach for the, the 400, the quarter milers. And I remember he was just like a big over distance kind of Clyde Hart, but even more, like even more mundane. It was like 16. I remember the, the 200s day, it was like, all right, they're running 10 200s. Then it was 12. Then it's 14. One day they had 16. And I remember looking at the, just the expression, these guys face as they're doing like their 13th 200 and it's just total boredom. But then, but you know what? It's like, it's not, but you instantly just make a total villain out of that 16 by 200. Cause maybe when that coach did that type of stuff himself, if he ever did it, maybe it was all really meaningful to him. And if you could go back and you change the look on those athletes faces somehow, I mean, again, I would prescribe something else, but you know, it's sometimes life just gives you something and you have to make the best of it. And if you change yeah. your emotional state on every one of those 200s to something, the highest emotional state you could muster, the highest amount of interest you could muster. And to be completely honest, for me, if I just threw like three or four hurdles out for those 200s and every time it was something a little different, well, that'd be pretty interesting for me. I could hack 16 200s then. I would be like, it would totally change it for me. In fact, if someone wanted to do some research, I think an interesting research project would be an amount of work and just running and, you know, for a high volume demand, but then you put something interesting in, like just hurdles to jump over and. You've just changed everything. So I, I think there's, that- sci- there's science behind that. So they've been able to show that like when children don't like listening to their parents, there's a specific octave in their voice that their ears no longer hear anymore. So when, you know, or like the, the husband, you know, the wife's always nagging. The husband never listens. You never hear this. Well, it's we've trained the husband or the athlete, the child, whatever it is. They've trained that like, I don't really like this coach. I don't, I'm associating this activity with the coach. I no longer like it. So they start tuning out their voice. They start tuning out an octave. And so they're not, they no longer hear it and they start becoming bored. So then what is, how do you get out of that? Well, then, you know, that's where you have to throw a higher frequency towards that situation. And the highest fre- frequency that you can do is, is love, which sounds corny at all. It's not for them. It's not for anybody else. It's for you. It's that if you love whatever is going on in the situation, you just love it, then you're going to, you're no longer going to be, it's no longer going to be a stressor on you. It's no longer going to be hindering you from doing something. You're no longer directing your attention because all you're doing is focusing your intention on how you don't like the coach. You don't like the activity. He doesn't change anything up. This sucks. I want to do hurdles. I want to, you know, and so you start focusing all of the energy elsewhere that that's just, you know, complaining and it just draws you down. So then you got to, you got to, okay, well, okay. I got to stop that. Cancel that. Okay. All right. I, you know, I love whatever his name is. I love coach Williams. I love what we're doing. Okay. Now when I'm going, okay, I know we're just sprinting these two hundreds, but what can I focus on when I sprint these two hundreds? What, what can I feel within my feet? What can I feel within my, my, 
you know, my hips or my shoulders. And so you, you can start changing the situation of rather than what's going on and what you, you know, what you have to do and you can start altering it. Like that, that is an option. Like you can change how you're perceiving the event, even if you have to continue to do the event, that's, you know, not it. So I, I know many athletes are, are stuck in situations like that and, it, and it's tough. It, I'm not saying it's easy. None of this is easy to be able to, to change how you think and change how you act. It takes practice. You know, you can't just go to the gym, lift one dumbbell and say, my biceps just grew 10 times. No, it's, you have to continually rep certain things out in order to get that growth. So it's the same thing with the mind uh, and being able to get it so that you love every situation. So the situations aren't affecting you. They're not taking away your energy. They're not drawing it. They're not making you bored and they're not hindering future situations that you could be exposed in. You know, they're not damaging that. And so essentially, again, you become the captain of your own soul where <laughs> you're doing you and you're not letting outside influences dictate how you feel and how you perform, et cetera, like that. Because you're just, you're focused on who you are as an identity and growing that. Yeah, love it. So last thing, I just wanted to get to this uh, quickly. I know we probably didn't get to a, a lot of questions I had, but that's okay. A lot of these, um, a lot of these podcasts where I don't get to every question, I, that's just that free kind of exchange of ideas and flow of consciousness is really cool. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'd be curious as to your thoughts on uh, the easy strength mentality. And I, I'm a huge fan of easy strength, the idea of, because this is interesting, right? You, we, we talk about the maximal intent, like have max intent on everything, but I think it's easy to confuse that with straining intent, if that makes sense. And I think my opinion, I, I'm already kind of giving it away with my, why I like easy strength, but I, I'm curious of your thoughts on the easy strength mentality. So walking under a bar for people not familiar with that, it's, it's low, vo it is low volume, but it's relatively high frequency in many cases. And it's not getting emotionally like connected to the weight or emotionally amped up before you do the set, doing like two sets of five and being done, you know, or going through your movements like that. I'm curious on your, your take on the easy strength. It probably does run counter in some ways to some of the things we talked about, but for the weights element of it, that high strain weights, what's your take on that? Yeah. So I, I mean, I have to speak at it as a global because everything I do is just as the bot, like you mentioned earlier, the body is several different entities to say all working as one entity. So uh, when I speak about this, this is going to be all across the board, whether it's the training or the ISOs or the strength work or whatever it is. But the, the way that I see that is I have to understand that there's a difference between the weight room training to say versus the actually going out and performing some sort of skill. And so when I have people do isometrics or they're doing some sort of shock training, I don't have much people lift a lot. Of, like a lot of stuff is the shock training, which is what I say true shock is to make sure that when, you know, and again, I've made sure to measure this and this is actually occurring. And a lot of my, my research studies about this is that, you know, if, if somebody throws a baseball and their muscle is firing at faster than 200 milliseconds, then that means that my weight room exercise to me better be causing the muscle to be able to respond at 200 milliseconds or faster, because then now I know that the body is being trained more intensely than what the demand of the sport is. So I, I, I can't really speak with much of the lifting, but I can speak into the weight room of what that looks like for me. And like I said, for me, that looks more of the fast contractions. But anyway, so when I'm doing that in the weight room, I'm telling them to max contract as hard as they can. Or if they're not max contracting, I'm, they're focusing on their breath because the breath control, the breath is one of the coolest things ever because you have this autonomic nervous system. And one of the ways that you can influence, you can raise or lower your heart rate. You can change your breathing rate. You can change all these different endocr you know, endocrine systems within your body just with your breath. And so your breath is your one avenue in order to put yourself back into a sympathetic state or put yourself in a parasympathetic state. You can do whatever you want with your breath. So when I'm training, it's, it's very focused on, okay, maybe we're focusing on the breath or maybe we're all out max contraction. We're doing the uh, continuous shock training. Uh, and that all needs to be max intent. There's no questions that, you know, about that. That has to be ma as maximally as you can. Even if you can't contract the muscle, your intention to that muscle has to be maximum where you give yourself a headache thinking about how to contract the muscle you can't contract. Okay, so that's one side. Then when we go to the, the, the skill work size, I say throw that all out the window. You don't need to focus on the max exertion. All I want you to do is figure out basically how you can flow. How can you feel? How can you find rhythm? And we're not trying to necessarily like force anything because once, once people start mm -hmm. forcing things, you know, they start pushing away at the ground or they, 
they're not running, you know, their, their speed starts slowing down. So you, you have to teach them, okay, well, how do you find rhythm? How do you find tension? How do you find the timing? You know, lot, you know, the whole thing Darian Barr talks about, you know, I'm, I'm focused on fast. What makes me fast? You know, it's the timing. It's not about the strength, you know, how, you know, if it's the when and the how, you know, I'm focused on, you know, <laughs> that whole aspect. And so th- that, that's more of what you're focusing on when it comes to the off the weight room stuff is how does that stuff work? You know, how can you get the timing the rhythm to be focused? And then in the weight room, I'm looking at the maximum, like, you, you know, I, if, if your muscles are supposed to be firing at this amount of speed, then we better be training them at that amount of speed. And it better be more volume than what you're experiencing in your competition. So that when you go experience your competition, your 80% jog is somebody else's hundred percent max sprint or your 60% intent out on the game is now somebody else's 80%, just whatever it is, but it's, it's putting it. So now you, you know, you can, you know, that you can work in between 30% and hundred percent. And you know, for which opponent, you know, which percentage you need to exert yourself in to be able to, you know, go against that opponent. So that, I, I don't know if that's exactly what you're looking for, but that's, that's kind of how I see the, the, that whole kind of mentality is, is, is kind of a little bit of how I see the weight room and a little bit how I see when you're training for the skill work and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe my thoughts, you know, as you were saying, it's like you, you could even just break it down to simple movements versus complex movements and complex being the, the ultimate complex is skill. Throwing a baseball hundred miles an hour is pretty damn complex compared to like doing a front squat. Even. I mean, they're both complex to be honest, but I would say throwing I a mean, baseball. Also, who, who cares? Just pick it up and throw it. Yeah. It, well, yeah. Like, but kind of what no, I was don't saying. Don't make it complex. Yeah. I mean, just from a perspective of what we're saying, like the intention, like you were saying, when you get to the skill, you want to be a little more relaxed. You don't want to strain. Yeah. But if it's a really simple skill, like let's just say I'm doing a calf raise up and down as fast, and a, you know, a power calf raise, stop at the bottom, stop at the top, you know, max intent, like, I think you could, you know, if you're going to quote unquote strain a little bit on that, trying to be as powerful as you can on that single movement, you're not, I don't think you're going to screw yourself up. If you're trying to strain on a 10 meter fly sprint every time, I think you could screw yourself up. You know what I'm saying? Like some of these simpler, and you could even say a simple movements like May, just maybe, a, lunge, a lunge drop. But or, it, you can get people out of pain with changing how they perceive an event. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's my feel. That's, you know, I, I know I'm going to chiropractic, but more of what I'm going into is quantum medicine, which is, you know, more of like a health coach changing the way that people think, you know, the healing occurs when on this, like it doesn't healing, no healing occurs at the physical body. The physical body is just a manifestation of what's going on deeper. And so when you start fe- experiencing pain or strain, you know, whatever it is, fatigue, all it is, is just, it's just an alarm system. And so you have to then figure out what's the mechanism behind all of that to be able to get them out of pain. So then that, that's other things that I'm focusing on. So is, if somebody wants to exert themselves and all out exert 100 you know, sprints, sure, go for it. I'll monitor them appropriately uh, you know, the best way that I can. But they better have that own intellectual of, of knowing, you know, being able to handle it. It's not just, again, a blind, I'm going to go out and just exert hundred sprints. I mean, people do it and they do get away with it. So I'm, you know, it yeah, was for me to say not, but it was, um, it, it, oh, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, I, I, one book I had read, sorry to interrupt you. I just, I wanted to mention, no, before I forgot. Great. It was, um, uh, I was reading a book by, uh, coach Pat Connolly, who she coached Evelyn Ashford in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, was a track coach at UCLA back in the day. Really good book on her story of coaching Evelyn. And this is when the East Germans were all hopped up on steroids and they were saying all this completely untouchable uh, throws records that I don't know if they're still ever going to be broken. Some of those like the jab, well, the old javelin, but the shot put and disc is just crazy. And anyways, um, you know, Evelyn you know, and Pat were just adamant about not taking any drugs and that like the volume, I think there was a workout where Evelyn did like the volume was insane. I mean, it was insane. It was like, I mean, she ran 1076 uh, back, you know, and who knows me, that could have been a few hundreds faster even on some of today's tracks and whatever, but it, so 1076 and was running like a hundred, she ran 100 hundreds workout, 100, 100 meters, but it was like a, called a shakeup. It was a, ver- it wasn't an all out version of it. It was a more of a technical type thing, but like there was some of that high volume type stuff in there. And these workouts would take her hours to do. And we would look at that on that, just on the outset. And yeah, I mean, there's probably some tweaks you could have made to that program that could have made it, you know, quote unquote better. I would say with maybe some of the, you know, the way we think about training now, but I, I also think we would look at that like workout and be like, oh, that's so dumb. Like, why would you do that? That 
she would have ran 10 five if not for the and i don't i don't think so you know like i don't i think there might be some other things in that program that could be optimized but i just think that we tend to write off like stuff like that just under the oh it's just pure like i think there's just more under the hood kind of like you're saying yeah oh yeah for sure and again it's at the end of it you know i i used to get worked up you know it's easy to get worked up and and watch people train athletes and you're like well how's that ever gonna work and you know that that's not applicable and but it, it, like i said then i'm just wasting my energy and i'm not focused on whatever that athlete did is what they want it's, it's the environment they created for themselves if, if that's the environment they wanted, the tough it out Navy SEAL environment, that's what they got. If they wanted more of the, the, the tempos or the slows or, or feed the cats or whatever it is, that's what they got. They, they created that reality for themselves of the training. And so because they created that reality, then it was perfect for them. Whatever they did was perfect. And I don't think it's, it's for us to say it was wrong or it's right or speculate. Well, if I had him, he would run mm-hmm. tenths of a second faster or whatever. Whatever they did was perfect. It's what they did and it was perfect. And, and, and that's it. You know, if, if, if you had them, then how you trained them would be perfect. It's just how you do it. And, and if you look back at it and you want to say, Oh, I want to adjust this or just that, that's part of the per- you know, the perfection within it is, is changing and altering, et cetera. So, you know, I think it's just more of, we get so focused on, you know, what buzzes us or what ticks us. And at the end of it, it's just the athlete and he's just training and whatever he's doing is the reality that he created. So let him be in that reality. And who's for us to say what's wrong or what's right? Like, you know, when I'm working with athletes, I, I can train them the best that I can. I can, you know, try and use things that are engaging the mind and try and create this creativity. But like I said, whatever reality they're living in is, is whatever it is. Like there's, I'm either influencing them one way or influencing them a different way or whatever. It's just, it's just is. You know, and, and it's perfect the way that it is, it is, is kind of what I had to learn. Yeah, it's, in, it's an interesting way to look at it, I think, versus always just saying, because it is almost that innate ego response. Oh, I could do better than that. Oh, that was wrong. You know, oh, if I yeah. was in their shoes. So I think that understanding that there's, well, I mean, just one, just understanding our own ego tendencies, but then also looking at all the possibilities, uh, I think is an important practice. So. Well, hey, Jared, I know we could talk about this stuff forever, man, but I think that's a good place to shut it down for now. Uh, you know, maybe we can save the back half for some other time, but hey, thanks for being on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was good talking to you here. I, I really appreciate your time on the show. Yeah, it's been a true honor. I, I remember being a sophomore, junior in, in college when I first learning about training and back when you, when you first started, I, I started listening, you know, back when you had the OGs of Dan Victor and corpus and and deet so it's a true privilege and an honor to be on because i've been listening for a very long time and ever since the beginning so it's been a true joy thanks for tuning in i appreciate you being here and we'll see you next week